Why do dogs pant? When people get hot, millions of tiny sweat glands, located deep in their skin, produce sweat, or perspiration, which evaporates into the air and cools them. Dogs, however, have very few sweat glands. So they pant or breathe hard to cool off, which works in a similar way. Panting produces a strong flow of air that blows away moisture from a dog's lungs and mouth. The evaporating moisture takes some of the dog's body heat away with it. Just like a sweating person, a panting dog usually needs a good drink of water to maintain body fluids and keep the cooling process going when conditions are hot. Which animal is the fastest? The cheetah clocked at speeds of 70 miles, 112 kilometers, per hour is the fastest animal on land. Cheetah's bodies, with their small heads, long legs and ridged foot pads that give them extra traction, are designed especially for speed. Humans, by the way, have been known to travel short distances as fast as 28 miles 45 kilometers per hour. Measuring speed in sea animals is very difficult, but studies have shown that the sailfish is the fastest creature in the sea. Swimming at speeds up to 68 miles, 109 kilometers, per hour. The fastest animal in the air is the peregrine falcon. When flying horizontally, the peregrine falcon can go around 60 miles, 97 kilometers, per hour. It is during its high speed dives for prey that this bird breaks speed records, however. Flying at a speed of more than 200 miles, 322 kilometers, per hour. The peregrine falcon frequently kills its prey just by the force of impact. How many stars are there? Stars are arranged in galaxies throughout the universe. Galaxies are very large groups held together in disc-like shapes by gravitational forces. Our own galaxy, the Milky Way, has some hundred billion stars. With powerful telescopes, scientists have located billions more galaxies in the universe in addition to the Milky Way. And each of these galaxies probably contains many billions of stars. Many more galaxies may exist that scientists have not yet seen. The number of stars in the universe is almost as unimaginable as the vastness of the universe itself. How does music come from a compact disc? Not too long ago, music was recorded on a phonograph record. Which was the first invention that made a permanent record of sounds that could be played back. Sound vibrations like a voice singing or an instrument playing were changed by a microphone into 
electrical signals that directed a sharp needle to cut a wiggly groove into a spinning plastic or vinyl record. A record player with its needle riding lightly in the groove of a revolving record could reproduce the electrical signals and change them back into sound through its speakers. Today, compact discs, CDs, are used instead of phonograph records to record music. Less than 5 inches across, CDs can hold more music than long playing, LP, 12 inch records. This capacity is possible because a CD spins very fast as its signals are read. Up to 500 revolutions per minute, LPS make about 33 complete turns per minute. The spiral track of a CD is also very fine thinner than a human. Hair which allows more music to be fit onto its smaller surface. On the bottom side of a CD is a thin metal sheet. Tiny round depressions called pits which represent sound fill its spiral track. Just as needles were used to cut grooves into phonograph records. Chemicals eat away the metal on CDs to create these pits. A beam of laser light is used instead of a record player. Needle to change a CD's pitted track back into sound. Unlike ordinary light, which spreads out in all directions once it leaves its source. Laser light can be focused with great accuracy. It moves along the track of a CD, and sensors detect the pattern of shiny flat parts. Which reflect light back, and pits which don't. These on and off flashes of reflected light turn into electrical signals. A computer in a compact disc player, which has an enormous memory that stores every possible combination of on and off patterns. Converts the signals to musical notes with different pitches and volumes in the player's speakers. And then the music plays. Unlike phonographic sound. Which could be impaired by scratched records, dull playing needles, or wobbly turntables. The sound from compact discs is remarkably true to life because such problems don't affect. The efficiency of laser beams. A DVD, which stands for digital versatile disc. Uses very similar technology to a CD, only DVDs can hold much more data, about 7 times more than a CD. In recent years their outstanding quality have made DVDs increasingly popular. They can hold a full length movie as well as many added features, like subtitles in multiple languages. Commentaries from directors, extra scenes that were deleted from the final version of the movie, and more. Are mushrooms plants? Fungi, which include mushrooms, molds, and mildews, are not really plants. They have no real roots, leaves, or stems, and contain no chlorophyll with which to make their own food. That's why they aren't green and don't need sunlight. Fungi feed mostly on dead plant and animal matter. Which helps keep the environment clean and enriches the soil. Some fungi feed on live plants and animals, though, often harming their hosts. A fungal disease called rust, for instance, can completely ruin the wheat crop it has infected. 
Mushrooms are the visible parts of certain fungal, basidium. Growths that live underground, where they feed on dead and decaying matter. When these fungi are ready to reproduce they send up mushrooms. Fruiting bodies that carry spores for reproduction. Spores form on the gills of a mushroom underneath its cap. Within a few days they shoot out and scatter, and the fruiting body dies. Some of the billions of spores released will develop into new fungi. Autumn is the best time to spot mushrooms and other fungal fruiting bodies. How is fabric made from plants? Since ancient times, people have been using the fibers of plants to make cloth. Cotton, which comes from the cotton plant, and linen. Made from the flax plant, are the most important of these. The seeds of shrub-like cotton plants are surrounded by long, fluffy white fibers. The seeds and fibers are enclosed in capsules, or bowls. The bowls are picked either by hand or machine. And then the fibers are separated the from bowl and from the seeds. The fibers are then spun into yarn or thread strong enough to weave into cloth. Weaving is done on looms, which are frames or machines that interlace yarns or threads together. Different types of cotton plants produce fibers with different qualities. With some grown for their sturdiness and some for softness. For centuries, cotton has been grown in many parts of the world. And the cloth and objects made from it have provided valuable trade between countries. But because cotton grows best in mild climates with plenty of rain. The United States is now the biggest producer of cotton. To make linen, the stems of tall flax plants are soaked until they are partially decomposed. Their long fibers are then removed and used to make yarn or thread that is woven into fabric. Until the widespread use of cotton for clothing. Beginning around 1800, people generally wore linen clothes. Linen has been used for so long that examples of it have been found in Egyptian tombs more than 3,500 years old. Although linen is stronger and finer than cotton, it is harder to make because its fibers break easily. Linen is made in many parts of the world, with Ireland being its biggest producer. Why do I have to take a time out sometimes? To help us survive, our bodies and minds are set up to respond. A certain way to situations that we think are threatening. We react physically to such situations first, and we think later. This response was very useful in the lives of prehistoric men and women when they roamed the planet and faced physical dangers constantly. When a wild animal attacked, for instance, a cave dweller fled or drew his or her weapon without stopping first to think about the danger he was in. In the modern world, we find ourselves in very few situations that threaten our lives. 
but our bodies still react to things in the same instant, physical way. When troubling situations occur, our feelings come first before our thinking takes over. When someone does something we don't like, or that upsets us. Our first reaction is to act on our feelings, which might include yelling or hitting. A person can get pretty worked up physically. Which doesn't allow him or her to listen to the thinking messages that are also going on inside. When an adult makes you take a time out, it takes you away from the upsetting situation. Your body and feelings can settle down then, and you can start to think. It is normal and natural to react strongly to things that put your body on alert, but as you get older, you will begin to recognize that most situations don't require a caveman response. You will be able to control your feelings better and use thinking to guide your actions. Why do certain smells have such powerful links to our memories? Memory is important when it comes to identifying a smell we are not born knowing what different scents mean. We have to learn to associate the smell of freshly baked cookies with something we like to eat. Or to link the smell of burning wood with a nearby fire. But the link between memory and smell goes beyond identifying what that smell is sometimes. A scent can bring back a memory very powerfully, even a memory that was buried deeply. Scientists aren't sure why this happens, but they do know that the scent organs are connected to the limbic system. The part of the brain that controls memory and emotions. Some experts believe that the memories recalled by scent, as opposed to those recalled by seeing a familiar face or hearing music. For example, seem stronger because they are linked to emotions. Studies have shown that people who are exposed to a certain scent while feeling especially happy or nervous will notice a return of those feelings when they smell that scent at a later date. Related studies have shown that when people learn something studying for an exam, for instance while smelling a specific aroma, they can remember more of what they learned when they smell that same aroma later. Why are loud noises and music bad for my ears? Too many loud sounds can damage the tiny hair cells inside your ears. These cells line the fluid-filled cochlea, a part of your inner ear, and change sound vibrations in the fluid into nerve impulses. These impulses then travel to your brain, where they are recognized as sound. Listening to loud sounds causes strong vibrations that flatten the hairs of the inner ear. Too much flattening keeps the hairs from springing back just like blades of grass that have been walked on too much and they eventually die. There is no way to fix or replace the hairs, and hearing is damaged forever. So the louder the noise and the longer you listen to it, the more harm can be done. Sound is measured in units called decibels. People talking normally measures about 60 decibels on the scale. Any noise that registers above 70 decibels can be dangerous. 
rock music at a concert usually produces about 110 decibels of sound. How do people who are blind get around? People who are blind rely on their other senses smell, touch, hearing, taste to help them manage in the world. Blind people have to memorize identifying features like sounds and smells, of the places that they often go. They also have to pay close attention to where things are located in their homes in order to get around safely. Always putting objects in the same places after you so that they can be found again. Some blind people use canes or guide dogs to get around. A white cane indicates that the person using it is visually impaired. Blind people tap their canes on sidewalks, floors, and streets. They learn to identify the locations of things like steps, walls, or doors simply by the different sounds that their cane taps make. Various high-tech devices have been invented, including laser canes that use sound or light waves that bounce off objects and send signals to the user about where these objects are located, what they might be made of, and how big they are. Guide dogs, or seeing eye dogs, are specially trained to lead blind people about. The dog and the person work as a team with the dog following commands that help the blind person go about her day. The dog, in turn, signals the person when she is approaching a curb or when it is safe to cross a street. Why is the bald eagle the official national symbol of the United States? In 1782, six years after the end of the Revolutionary War, leaders of the newly independent United States were designing a national seal, an image that would appear on official documents and elsewhere. Eventually these men settled on the bald eagle for the great seal of the United States. The bald eagle was chosen in part because it was believed to be found only in North America. The bald eagle was also admired for its strength, its noble appearance, and the freedom of its life spent soaring through the sky. While the eagle became an important American symbol when it was adopted for the U.S. seal in 1782, it wasn't until 1787 that it officially became the national emblem. The bald eagle has been used for the official seals of many states. And it has appeared on stamps, currency, or paper money, and several coins, including the quarter. The bald eagle's head is covered with white feathers. How do mirrors work? A mirror can be any smooth, shiny surface that reflects, or bounces back, light. But most mirrors are made of sheets of glass. The backs of which have been coated with thin layers of reflective materials or metals, including silver. We see all things because light waves reflect off objects and into our eyes. 
creating images that are recognized by our brains. You can see yourself in a mirror because light rays reflected from your body bounce off the mirror's shiny surface and back into your eyes. But this double reflection creates an odd effect everything appears reversed. When you hold a book up to a mirror, for instance, the printing appears backward. In the same way. This double reflection of light allows you to see yourself in a glass window or on the surface of still water. But the reflection will not be as clear as one produced by a mirror. Because some of the light waves that are reflected from you will be absorbed by the glass or water instead of bouncing back. If the wind disturbs the surface of your watery mirror, the water will absorb even more light. And the smooth areas now small and scattered will produce parts of a reflection so broken up that it will be too unclear to recognize. What makes holes in Swiss cheese? Enzymes, complex proteins, special bacteria and molds are added to milk to make cheese. These different additives give cheeses their distinctive looks and tastes. The bacteria that are used to make Swiss cheese remain active for an especially long time. These bacteria turn milk sugars into gas long after. The cheese has developed its firm outer covering or rind. Because the gas can't escape at that point, it gathers in pockets as the cheese continues to ripen inside. Creating bubbles which look like holes when the cheese is sliced. What happens when my hand or foot falls asleep? When a lot of weight is on your arm or leg for a certain amount of time. It goes numb, along with your hand or foot. Your limb has fallen asleep. Normally, blood flows freely through your arm or leg. Bringing it oxygen and nutrients and taking away waste products. The pressure on your limb restricts blood flow. This restriction makes your cells work less efficiently there especially your nerve cells, which are connected to the touch sensors in your skin. That's why a sleeping limb feels numb. When the pressure is removed from your arm or leg, full blood flow and function gradually return. That's when you have that funny, prickly feeling called pins and needles. Your nerve cells irritated by the waste buildup in your body tissues are finally able to send regular messages to your brain, telling it that something is wrong with your circulation. But by that time your limb is already on its way to working normally again. The annoying prickly feeling soon disappears as full. Circulation returns and your nerves are no longer alarmed. What is the largest fish? The largest living fish is the whale shark. It usually grows to about 30 feet, 9 meters, in length, 
but some have been measured at more than 50 feet. 15 meters, long, weighing several tons, a ton is 2,000 pounds, or 908 kilograms. These gentle giants pose little threat to humans, however. They have very small teeth and eat mainly fish and plankton. Which are tiny organisms that drift in both salt water and fresh water, providing food for numerous animals. Whale sharks, recognizable by their distinctive skin pattern of small dots and stripes. Swim very slowly, just beneath the surface of the water. Do all people live in houses? Nearly all people in the world live in some kind of shelter. But a great many of these shelters look very different from the kinds of buildings we think of as homes. House types differ around the world because climates. Local building materials, and ways of life vary greatly. In Southeast Asia, for example, where many people live on the banks of large rivers that frequently overflow, houses are built on stilts. In South America's rainforests, tribes of indigenous, or native, Peoples build huts with thick domed roofs made of palm leaves that keep the heavy rains out. People that live near marshy rivers sometimes use the heavy reeds that grow there to build their houses. And people who live near large forests often have houses made of wood. People who live in hot countries sometimes build their homes from bricks that are sun-dried blocks of mud. In many of these places, modern building materials are available. But the region's traditional shelters are still made because local materials are far cheaper. Some people take their homes with them. Such people are known as nomads and their portable homes. Are usually tents made of sturdy poles, ropes, and fabric. Nomads usually live off the land by raising livestock or hunting. They are constantly on the move, in search of food or grazing land for their animals. Their tents, which are easy to set up and take down, are carried along on their journeys. People who live in deserts, like the Bedouins of the Middle East, are frequently tent dwellers. But hunting bushmen in Africa's Kalahari Desert carry huts made of sticks and grass around with them for use as shelters at night. Most of the world's people don't have shelters with the features that we think are essential for comfort and safety in a home, like electricity and running water. A surprising 80% of the population live in what we would call substandard housing. What are tears for? Tears keep the delicate surface of the eyeball clean and wet. Tears are produced in glands, called lacrimal, above the outer corner of the eye. They spread across the eye surface with each blink. A blink takes about a third of a second, and most people blink about every six seconds. When you add it up you spend more than half an hour each day blinking. 
Tears that wash across the eye usually evaporate into the air or drain into tear ducts. Two tiny canals located at the inner corner of each eyelid. From there they pass down into the nose, where they keep nasal tissues moist. That's why you have to blow your nose when you've been crying. When you cry or get something in your eyes. You may produce more tears than the system ordinarily handles, and they may spill out onto your face. When I cut or scrape myself, why do I get a scab? When you get a cut or a scratch, you break blood vessels in, and sometimes below, your skin. Blood begins to leak out of them then, and platelets small ovals of special. Matter in the blood start to gather and stick together at the area of broken skin. Special chemicals also cause blood to thicken there. Forming webs that trap blood cells and keep them from escaping. As more blood cells are trapped, a clot forms. As it hardens, it becomes a scab. A shield that keeps outside germs from entering the damaged skin. Beneath the scab, the body can repair the tissues. The scab shrinks over time as the skin around it heals, and it falls off when all repair work is done. Why is cloning so controversial? The possibility of cloning human beings arouses curiosity and excitement in some people and deep suspicion and fear in others. Scientists and doctors have long intervened in the creation of new life. Such as using various fertility treatments to help people have babies who otherwise couldn't. But these techniques require doctors to assist in the process that happens in Nature the merging of a sperm cell from a man's body with an egg from a woman's body. Cloning bypasses that process altogether. Using one person's cells to create a new human being that will be identical to that person. That level of scientific involvement in the creation of human life makes many people uncomfortable. Supporters of cloning technology argue that there are numerous benefits to human cloning. Many scientists believe that cloning can lead to Important breakthroughs for people with incurable diseases. This type of activity, called therapeutic cloning, has as its goal the creation of certain kinds of cells rather than the duplication of a complete person. In such experiments, a human embryo, the group of cells that, if implanted into a uterus, would grow into a baby would be produced through cloning so that the embryo stem cells special cells that can develop into many different kinds of cells and tissue can be extracted destroying the embryo in the process stem cells can then be used to grow new tissue to replace a sick person's damaged organs or to cure diseases that otherwise would be fatal some scientists wish to pursue cloning technology to create babies for people who are unable to have children. And who wish to produce a child that shares their genetic makeup rather than adopting a baby. 
Many people have deeply felt concerns about cloning, particularly human cloning. They fear that this relatively new science is still too risky and unpredictable. Experiments with cloning a human might result in serious defects or health problems for the clone subjects. Even Ian Wilmood, the scientist who led the team that produced the cloned sheep dolly, has strongly objected to experimenting with human cloning before further research is done. Many people object to cloning on religious grounds, arguing that life is sacred. And only God not scientists and doctors can create new life. Others worry that the ability to clone a person might be abused by some who would spend a great deal of money to create a genetically perfect child, selecting certain traits and discarding others. Many people are disturbed by the thought that some people might use cloning technology to replace a loved one who had died. Canadian Which of the big cats is the largest? The colorful, striped tiger is the largest of the cat family. One type of tiger the Siberian is bigger than any lion. A male Siberian tiger can reach 13 feet, 4 meters, in length. Including his tail, and weigh up to 650 pounds, 295 kilograms. Do spiders really eat the bugs they catch in their webs? Yes, most spiders live on insects and other related arthropods. Very large spiders can capture small birds and snakes in their silk traps. Spiders know they've made a catch because they can feel the vibrations caused by struggling bugs caught in their strong, sticky webs. Sometimes spiders tightly wrap their prey in silk to subdue them. They usually kill their prey by injecting them with a paralyzing poison or venom that they produce. How do clocks and other things glow in the dark? When a substance is exposed to light, it absorbs light energy. The molecules of most substances usually release this excess energy in the form of light and heat but do it so quickly that the process can't be seen. Some substances, like calcium sulfide, however, are able to store a portion of the light to which they have been exposed, releasing it a bit at a time. This characteristic is called phosphorescence. Other substances can be added to phosphorescence to increase the amount of time that they can store light. Because the ability usually fades over time. Glow-in-the-dark toys and paint used on clock and watch dials are made of phosphorescent materials. While their slow-releasing light is not detectable during the day. It is very clear at night, when all is dark. Without light exposure, though, phosphorescent things won't work. Because they can't store light energy to release.
What is fog? Like clouds, fog forms from tiny droplets of water that have evaporated from moist soil or from bodies of water. Fog is basically a low-lying cloud that touches Earth's surface. Water vapor in the air condenses to form fog under many circumstances. On cool mornings, the warm water vapor coming off lakes or ponds meets cold air and forms steam fog. Fog can also appear when a cool front of air meets a warm front. Technically, fog is not fog unless visibility the distance you can see in. Front or behind you is reduced to about one half mile, or about one kilometer. How do erasers remove writing? When you write with a pencil you are rubbing its lead across a surface usually paper leaving marks. The marks are really tiny bits of the pencil lead, or graphite, that have stuck to the paper. The surface of an eraser, which is made of rubber or a similar material, is both soft and sticky. When it is dragged across pencil marks, the lead sticks to it. Conveniently, during rubbing, an eraser's surface breaks off in bits. Two, which gets rid of the areas where the pencil marks have stuck. The eraser surface remains clean and ready for more work. While the shreds of it that are black with lead can be brushed away. Only special erasers can remove ink, which sinks into paper instead of sticking to its surface. These erasers are made with sand in them to make them more abrasive. Because they need to rub away some of the paper in order to remove the ink marks. Erasing crayon marks doesn't work very well because the wax from which crayons are made stick well to paper but not to erasers. Usually trying to erase crayon leaves a smeary mess. What is the coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth? The coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth was at the Russian research station Vostok in Antarctica on July 21, 1983. The temperature was minus 128.6 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 89.6 degrees Celsius. How long ago did dinosaurs live? Dinosaurs first appeared about 230 million years ago, during the Triassic period. Their large size and vast numbers meant that they dominated animal life on Earth for millions of years. Dinosaurs became extinct around 65 million years ago, at the end of the Cretaceous period. The earliest human beings lived about 2 million years ago. Millions of years after the last dinosaur had died. Earth was much different when dinosaurs roamed the planet. Several hundred million years ago, instead of there being seven continents. Or large land masses, 
there was just one giant mass of land that was surrounded by ocean. This land mass gradually broke apart into separate continents. Areas that are now covered with tall buildings or mountain ranges were once beneath the sea. And scientists believe the climate was fairly warm throughout the year. By the end of the era in which dinosaurs lived, temperatures had cooled and distinct seasons had developed. Where do people go after they die? Because no one has come back to our world after dying. It is not possible to know for sure what happens to people after death. Nearly all the religions of the world believe that some kind of existence continues after life on earth stops, that a person's soul or spirit continues to exist in a way we can't really imagine even after his or her body is dead. In fact, a lot of religions teach the belief that our life on earth is a stage or time of preparation or a test by which we're judged, that leads to a final perfect state of existence that we will share with God in a spiritual realm after we die. Many people who don't subscribe to religious beliefs about an afterlife think that people simply end when they die. That once the physical body has died, all awareness and existence ceases. What is a test tube baby? Sometimes, a man and a woman who want to have a baby have trouble conceiving. Many factors can contribute to a fertility problem, and sometimes medical science can help fix it. One solution to infertility is something called in vitro fertilization. With this method, a woman's eggs are fertilized with a man's sperm outside the woman's body. Fertilization takes place in a laboratory, in a glass dish, not really in a test tube. Once fertilization occurs there and the fertilized eggs begin to grow. They are placed inside the woman's uterus to develop further. Eventually a baby is born, sometimes multiple babies are born if more. Then one of the fertilized eggs attaches to the uterus and develops fully. Kids who originate from this method of fertilization are no different from other. Kids they are simply children who began their lives outside their mother's bodies. Why do yellow jacket wasps bother picnickers? Yellow jacket wasps only appear at picnics in the late summer and fall. When there is less work for them to do in their colonies. The nectar producing flowers that they usually feed on are almost gone at that time of year so they settle for sweet things like soda and other picnic food. What causes warts? Warts are caused by certain viruses that invade skin cells and cause them to reproduce faster than normal, creating a hard bump. 
Warts can be spread by touch or by contact with skin shed by warts but most people are resistant to the different viruses that cause them and will not get warts even after contact. Although warts may not look very nice, they are not harmful. And they usually go away by themselves within a few months. Chemicals are available in drugstores that remove warts by destroying the abnormal skin cells that make them. Or doctors can remove warts by freezing, burning, or scraping them off. What is spit? Your mouth is kept moist and clean by a watery liquid called saliva, or spit. Which is made by pairs of salivary glands located under your jaw, in front of your ears, and under your tongue. Saliva mixes with food as you chew, softening it so that it can be more easily swallowed. In addition, Saliva starts the digestive process because it contains an enzyme or chemical that changes the starch in food into sugar. The production of saliva increases when food is in the mouth or even with the sight and smell of good food hence the use of the word mouth-watering to describe delicious or fragrant meals. Why do certain smells trigger vivid memories? You're at a school fair, and you walk past the cotton candy machine, getting a whiff of the sweet smell. Suddenly you have a strong, clear memory of the trip you took last summer to. An amusement park the memory so vivid it feels like you're actually there. Why are dams built? Dams, which are structures that hold back water, have been built since ancient times. They are usually made of earth, rock, brick, or concrete or a combination of these things. They are constructed to control the flow of water in a river, and they are built for a number of reasons. One reason is to prevent flooding. Heavy rains in high country may cause water levels in a river to rise. As the river flows downhill, it may overflow its banks, flooding communities located downstream. A dam can prevent this by stopping or slowing rushing water, allowing it to be released at a normal rate. Dams are also frequently used to store water for general use and farming. When a river's flow is restricted by a dam, Water often spreads out behind the dam to form a lake or reservoir in the river valley. That water can then be used as needed. Preventing water shortages and crop damage during long periods of dry weather. A great number of dams today are used to make electricity. Such hydroelectric dams are built very tall. To create a great difference in the height of the water level behind and in front of it. High water behind a dam passes through gates in the dam wall that allow it to fall to the river far below. As the water falls, it flows past huge blades called turbines. The turbines run generators that make electricity. 
One of the world's largest and most productive hydroelectric dams is the Hoover Dam. Located on the Colorado River between Nevada and Arizona. Built in the 1930s, it is 726 feet, 221 meters, high and 1,244 feet, 379 meters, long. Its reservoir, Lake Mead, the world's largest supplies water to several states. Allowing huge regions of naturally dry terrain in Southern California, Arizona, and Mexico to flourish. Many modern dams are used for all three purposes, flood control, water storage, and hydroelectric power. Why do clothes need to be washed? If you want to look clean and smell nice your clothes must be washed frequently. Most clothing is made of tiny threads that are woven together. As you go about your day. Dirt and odors get trapped in the weave of your clothes and can only be removed by washing. Clothes must be jiggled and swished around quite a bit in water as is done in a washing machine to best remove dirt and odors from their tiny hiding places. Detergent is added to water to help the process, it can break up oily dirt into smaller pieces that can be whisked away and it can surround other dirt particles and pull them away from fabric. Washing machines are run by electric motors that turn large blades inside a big drum or tub that is filled with water. The blade turns back and forth, pushing soapy water and clothes around. A front-loading machine has no blades, but the drum turns and tumbles the clothes to get them clean. A washing machine automatically gets rid of dirty water and rinses the clean clothes before wringing water out of them, making them nearly dry. Before washing machines, people had to use muscle power and a great deal of time to loosen dirt from the weave of clothes. They did this by stamping on wet clothes with their feet. Or beating them against rocks, or rubbing them on bumpy washboards to get them clean. Why are there so many insects? There are so many insects because they are essential to life on Earth and play many important roles in keeping our planet healthy. Most of the world's flowering plants, about 80%, are pollinated by insects. Insects carry pollen from the male parts of a blossom to the female parts of another plant's flower, allowing reproduction. Most of our fruits and vegetables are the result of this kind of plant reproduction. Insects also feed on the remains of dead plants and animals, keeping our environment clean and returning nitrogen, carbon, and other valuable elements to the soil in their waste. In addition, insects are a vital part of Earth's food chain, providing nourishment for one another. There are many thousands of insect-eating insects. As well as for reptiles and amphibians, for birds and fish, and for mammals, such as mice and bats. 
In many parts of the world, insects even make up an important part of the human diet. Why do giraffes have such long necks? Giraffes, the tallest of all animals, have such long necks because they eat leaves from the tops of some very high trees, beyond the reach of other animals. Living in the grasslands of Africa, they feed chiefly on acacia and mimosa trees. Using their long tongues and strong lips to pull off the highest leaves. A baby giraffe is about 6 feet, 1.8 meters, tall at birth, and a full-grown male giraffe can reach a height of 18 feet. 5.4 meters, from his hooves to the top of his head, about as high as a two-story house. A giraffe may have a neck that measures up to 7 feet, 2 meters, long. Still, giraffes have the same number of bones or vertebrae in their necks as we do the giraffe's bones are just much longer. Giraffes also have very long legs, which contribute to their great height. While their long legs allow them to outrun most of their enemies, they also cause a problem. Giraffes must spread their legs wide apart in order to reach anything on the ground, like water or grass. The position is an awkward one and leaves them vulnerable to attacks from predators. But they can protect themselves with their large hooves. Kicking a beast even as powerful as a lion to death. Will I be a parent someday? Deciding whether or not to have children is something every adult has to decide for him or herself. Statistics of married people in the United States indicate that you have a good chance of becoming a mother or father someday more than half of all mar ride couples in America have children. Of course, it isn't necessary to marry to become a parent, but many people do. The average American family has two children, though some families have one child and others have more. If a man and a woman cannot have a baby for health reasons, they may be able to adopt a child whose own biological mother and father cannot take care of him or her, and raise the child as their own. It really makes no difference where a child comes from when it comes to being a mother and a father. Lots of people can produce babies physically, but it is the caring for and the worrying about and the endless love for their children that truly make people mothers and fathers. What can you do to stay safe when you are outside or away from home? Here are some basic guidelines, play with at least one other kid and in familiar places. Don't go near a car with a stranger in it, even if the person says he or she has a gift for you or needs your help to find a lost pet, or is asking for directions. Think about it this way, if an adult really needed help, he or she would ask another adult, not a kid. Don't accept a ride home from school or anywhere from someone you don't know. Even if that person says your parents asked him or her to pick you up, 
and even if that person knows your name. Basically try to avoid situations where you are alone with an adult you don't know unless it is a person your parents have arranged for you to meet with, like a doctor or a counselor. If a stranger approaches you, tell that person to please not speak to you because you don't know him or her. If the stranger continues toward you, start yelling and run away. If you need help, your best bet is to go to a public place like a store, a library, or especially a police station. Afterward, be sure to tell your parents about your experience with the stranger. Why does my skin turn red or brown if I stay out in the sun for a long time? A sunburn occurs when your skin is overexposed to the rays of the sun. Too much sunlight inflames surface skin and the tissues beneath it just like a regular. Burn from touching something hot causing redness, hotness, tenderness, and swelling. In bad cases, blisters may even appear as the body begins to form and protect new skin to replace the skin damaged by sunburn. Usually people who have fair, or light, skin get sunburns. Such people have less melanin in their skin the pigment that determines skin color. As well as hair and eye color. Melanin is made in special cells called melanocytes, people with light skin have fewer of these. Sun exposure makes melanocytes produce more melanin in an effort to Darken skin protecting it from damage by shading its deeper layers. This process creates what we know as a suntan. Dark skinned people can produce a lot of melanin fast tanning quickly when they are in the sun. But light skinned people usually get burned before. Their melanocytes can produce the amount of melanin needed for protection. Fair people can get tans only if they do it very slowly. Exposing themselves to the sun a little bit at a time. Scientists think that various groups of people around the world developed different skin colors because of where their ancestors once lived. In hot, sunny places, people develop dark skin for protection. In cooler places, where sunlight was not as strong, people developed lighter skin. What do a M and PM mean? The abbreviation A. M stands for the Latin phrase anti Mary Diem, which means before noon. PM stands for post Mary Diem, which means afternoon. Meridian, the English spelling, which used to mean midday, refers to an imaginary line that would appear if you could draw a line from the North Pole to the South Pole. The terms came into use in ancient Rome, when the movements of the sun were used to measure time. At three points during the day when the sun rose, when the sun set, and when the sun was directly overhead at midday it was easy enough for the Romans to determine the time. 
so they divided the period of daylight into two parts the period of time before midday a.m., and the period of time after, p.m. How much snow makes an inch of rain? Ordinarily, 10 inches of snow has about the same amount of water as 1 inch of rain. But temperature affects this general rule. The dry, fluffy snow we see during very cold weather holds less. Water it could take 30 inches of that snow to equal 1 inch of water. The heavy, Wet snow that falls when temperatures are just around freezing contains more. Moisture as few as 3 inches of that kind of snow could melt into 1 inch of water. Why are please and thank you magic words? Most human beings live with other people all their lives. You grow up in a family, learn along with classmates in your school. And participate with your friends and neighbors in activities in your community. You are a citizen of a country, which is one of many that make up the world. People have always lived together and over the years have developed something called manners. Or etiquette, that help make all this togetherness of so many individuals a little easier. While these rules of conduct have changed from century to century and vary from place to place. They are all based on the idea that a person should treat others like he or she would like to be treated. People who have good manners are said to be polite. Polite people are appreciated because they have respect for others. Please and thank you are not magic words like abracadabra. Which a magician says as he pulls a rabbit out of a hat. But they are special words because they make dealing with other people go more smoothly. People depend on one another for all sorts of things. We have to ask for help or permission all the time. Saying please shows that your request also comes with respect for the person you are asking. People are usually more willing to fulfill the requests of those who treat them with respect. Similarly, after someone gives you something or assists you. It is polite to say thank you to show your appreciation. Someone whose actions are appreciated will be more likely to help out or be generous again. So you can see how being polite can help people get things done. The words please and thank you make the world a more thoughtful and generous place. Can flowers be eaten? Believe it not, people have been eating flowers for centuries. The broccoli and cauliflower that we eat are actually clusters of flowers. Artichokes are also flower heads. Even some blossoms that look more like regular flowers pansies and roses. For instance have a long edible history. Flowers can taste sweet, minty, or bitter. They give a special flavor or even a pretty look to many foods. 
but it is very important to know which flowers, or parts of flowers, can be eaten, because lots of plants are poisonous. Even if you know it isn't poisonous, it's better not to eat blooms that you find growing outside. Because you don't know if they've been treated with chemicals, pesticides, to control insects. Safe, edible flowers can be found in food stores. Or you can grow your own from seeds that come in specially. Labeled packets that tell you the flowers will be okay to eat. What is organic farming? While most large farms today use chemicals to control weeds and insects and to produce increased amounts of vegetables, milk, or eggs, some farmers have chosen to run their farms without chemicals. Organic farmers believe that the chemicals many farmers use can be damaging to the environment and to the people that eat the food grown on such farms. They feel that natural fertilizers and pest control methods are just as effective and far healthier. A British farmer and scientist named Albert Howard began the practice of Organic farming as an alternative to modern chemical-based methods in the 1930s. His ideas have spread all over the world, taking hold in the United States in the late 1940s. A basic principle of organic farming is to focus on keeping the soil rich with nutrients by feeding it natural fertilizers like cow manure. Such fertile soil can help create stronger plants that are better able to resist disease and insects. Organic farmers also prevent insect damage by putting up insect traps or by bringing in beneficial insects that feed on the harmful ones that are causing the problem. In extreme cases, they need to use pesticides, but to continue being certified as Organic farmers in the United States, such farmers need to use botanical pesticides. Those that are made from plants, rather than synthetic, or man-made, chemicals. Organic farmers also try to do more tasks using human power rather than gas-powered vehicles. Thereby using less fuel and cutting down on pollution. Organic farms that raise livestock like dairy cows or chickens feed the animals with natural food. Avoiding chemicals and growth hormones that make cows produce more milk and chickens produce more eggs. Some organic farmers also allow their animals to roam in a large area, such animals are described as free range. Rather than keeping them in small, climate-controlled pens for their entire lives. While organic farming began in a small way in experimental gardens and small family-run farms it has grown into a huge industry. As more and more people looked for organically grown fruits and vegetables in their grocery stores, more and more companies began producing certified organic foods. At the beginning of the 21st century, organic farming was a $7.70 billion per year. Industry in the United States a small but significant percentage of the entire food selling industry. What is the most important organ in my body?
while many of our organs are vital, meaning we could not live without them. The brain is the most complex and the most important part of our bodies. The brain is the body's command center, everything we do eating, talking, walking, thinking, remembering, sleeping is controlled and processed by the brain. Our brain tells us what's going on outside our bodies, whether we are cold or hot, for instance. Or whether the person we see coming toward us is a friend or a stranger, as well as what's going on inside our bodies. Whether we have an infection or a broken bone, or whether we feel happy or sad. The key to the body's nervous system, the brain contains billions. Between 10 billion and 100 billion, of nerve cells, or neurons. Neurons combine to form the body's nerves. Thin cords that spread from head to toe and all parts in between. Neurons take in and send out electrical signals, called impulses. That control or respond to everything your body does and feels. The brain is like a very busy, high-speed post office. Constantly receiving messages and sending them out all the time, it handles millions of nerve impulses every second. An interesting fact about the brain, while it is responsible for receiving and transmitting. All messages of pain for the whole body, the brain itself does not have pain receptors. That means that, if you could somehow gain access to another person's brain. You could poke it or pinch it and that person wouldn't feel the pain. The human brain is divided into three main parts, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, and the brain stem. The largest part of the brain, about 85% of its total weight. The cerebrum, controls emotions, thought, memory, and speech. It is divided into a right and left side, called hemispheres. And each side is divided further into parts called lobes. Its thick outer covering, called the cortex, is made up of a type of tissue called gray matter. The cerebellum coordinates the kinds of movements we don't usually think about. It helps us walk upright and in a straight line, it keeps us balanced so we don't tip over. And it gives us coordination so we can run and play. The brain stem connects the brain with the spinal cord. It controls our body's vital processes like breathing, digestion, and heart rate. How do x-rays work? X-rays are similar to visible light in that both are forms of electromagnetic energy which travels in waves. But X-rays have much shorter wavelengths than light, so they are invisible. Just as light can pass through some things, like glass, X-rays can pass through certain materials. They can pass through your skin, muscles, and organs, for example but not through dense things like your bones, which contain heavier atoms. When you have an X-ray taken, the waves are projected through you onto a film or plate that is coated with special chemicals. Most X-rays are stopped when they hit a bone but pass through other body parts. 
which appear dark on the X-ray after it is developed. Bones stand out light and clear. When organs like the stomach or intestines need to be X-rayed, the patient drinks a special liquid that stops the rays. That liquid coats the organ, and a picture can be taken. Doctors take great care to minimize the number of X-rays given to any one patient because the radiation can damage living tissue. But sometimes the ability of X-rays to destroy cells is beneficial. Many cancer patients have undergone radiation therapy in an effort to kill diseased cells in tumors.